sacrilegious programs avoid. The Apostle John wrote long ago, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There is a hunger to know more about God and to understand more fully the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our study this morning, we hope to further satisfy this interest. There's no better place to introduce our study than John 15, verse 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, Jesus says, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus adds in John 16, verses 5 through 15, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged." I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit is being silenced, kept from doing his great work. We want to study the identity of the Holy Spirit. But first, enjoy our song. Wonderful.
You likely know the following hymns, Blessed Assurance, Near the Cross, Rescue the Perishing, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, and To God Be the Glory. But do you know what they have in common? Fanny Crosby, who lived from 1820 to 1915, wrote all of these and 8,000 other hymns. For years, she wrote 200 songs a year or four songs a week because publishers were hesitant to have so many hymns by one person in their hymnals. Crosby used nearly 100 different aliases to get so many songs published. You know what else? Crosby became blind as a baby. Early on, her grandmother and later the Crosby's landlady taught her Bible verses. Every week, Fanny memorized Bible verses until she had devoted to memory all of Genesis, all of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of the Gospels, most of the Psalms, all of Proverbs, and much more. That's amazing to me. No wonder she wrote so many great hymns. She sought to absorb the heart of God into her own heart by devouring the Word of God. Remember, she did all this while she was blind. According to Ira Sankey's autobiography, Miss Crosby visited the Cincinnati home of W.H. Doan. They were talking together about the nearness of God as the sun was setting and evening shadows were gathering around them. The subject so impressed the well-known hymn writer that before retiring, she had written the following words. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. The second verse. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. The title of our message this morning is The Identity of the Holy Spirit. So what does this touching story have to do with the Holy Spirit? We're talking about nearness to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to do His great work. The Bible says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God in Ephesians 6, 17. We find in Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So if Miss Crosby memorized most of the Bible with only the ability to hear, how motivating it should be for us to pour over it with even more energy and enthusiasm in committing it to memory with both our eyes and our ears. Why not resolve as a family to memorize a new scripture every week? During the process of a year, you have learned 52 scriptures. And this incredible old song, I am thine, O Lord, about belonging to God and envisioning the wonder of being drawn ever closer to God should make us think about the bliss of being eternally with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. While mystery veils aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life, God does reveal certain need-to-know facts on the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures. Let's notice who the Holy Spirit is, where the Holy Spirit is, and what the Holy Spirit does. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not merely a mystical force or impersonal power source. In Acts 5, verse 3 and 4, Peter confronts a Christian named Ananias for lying to the Holy Spirit, saying he had not lied to men, but to God. So obviously, lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God, a member of the Godhead Three. Consider that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit's everywhere. David tells us in Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, you are there. The Holy Spirit is also omniscient. The Holy Spirit knows everything. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, The Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Notice now several marks of the personhood of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit thinks and knows. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, Ephesians 4, 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us, Romans 8, 26. The Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit makes decisions according to His will, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. We find the Holy Spirit speaking in Acts 13, 2. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work. The Holy Spirit speaks today through Scripture. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says, we find the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles in John 16, 13, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. We read of the Holy Spirit testifying of Jesus in John 15, 26. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. Next, notice the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Collectively, they make up the Godhead or Godhood. It is important to clarify, though, that the Father is not the Son, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one Spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Jesus says in Mark 13, 32, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels nor the Spirit. Both of these scriptures demonstrate that though the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, there is a distinction between them. Jesus further demonstrates this truth in John 8, 17. It is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Jesus clearly shows that he and the Father make two witnesses. Furthermore, Jesus says in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Jesus was one comforter or helper and the Holy Spirit was another helper or comforter. They performed some of the same functions but maintained individuality as different members of the one Godhead. Next, we see that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Peter preaches in his sermon on Pentecost in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then Peter says in another sermon in Acts 5, 32, So also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. There is no question that the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of the Christian. Paul writes in Romans 8, 9, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Again, he writes unambiguously in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God and you are not your own? We've touched on this idea already. But let us consider again that the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. Jesus says in John 14, 16, I will pray the Comforter, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. This applies directly to the apostles. But, the Holy Spirit functions in a similar way today through the Word of God. See also Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
Jesus tells us in John 14, 26, that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you, the apostles, all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Then he adds in John 15, 26, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, apostles, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Then in John 16, 7, it is expedient for you, Jesus said, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. The Apostle John picks up the subject in 1 John 2, verse 1. If anyone sins, we have an advocate or comforter with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word paraclete, translated helper, comforter, advocate, is defined by Thayer to call to one's side, to one's aid, used in a court of justice to denote a legal assistant, counsel for defense, an advocate. Then, generally, one who pleads another's cause, an intercessor in the widest sense, helper, succorer, aider, assistant of the Holy Spirit, destined to take the place of Christ with the apostles, to lead them to a deeper knowledge of gospel truth and give them the divine strength needed to enable them to undergo trials and persecutions on behalf of the divine kingdom. The heart and soul of the Holy Spirit's intended role in our lives is illustrated when Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. That's, he did that in John 16, 13, and that says that he would guide the apostles into all truth. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God are so tightly interwoven that sometimes folks have difficulty in separating them. The Holy Spirit is not the Word of God, and the Word of God is not the Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul does tell us in Ephesians 6, 17, that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The idea of truth has become old-fashioned today. Our generation has largely concluded that truth is elusive or subjective. They say, you have your truth and I have my truth. These so-called truths may contradict each other, and that's not a problem for people today. Everyone gets to decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. In 1992 Barna poll, 52% of Christian professing teens denied the existence of absolute truth. But in 2002, 91% of Christian professing teens said there was no absolute truth. How can this be? It gets worse. The majority of professing Christian kids now say there was no bodily resurrection of Jesus. Mom and dad are dropping the ball. Pulpits across the country have substituted humor, recreation, and entertainment for fundamental doctrines. People are being entertained to death spiritually. Let's take a closer look at Barna's numbers. When asked on what basis do you make moral and ethical decisions, 40% of all teens responded that they do whatever feels right. 34% of Christian professing teens answered the same way. Meanwhile, 2% of teens in general and only 12% of Christian professing teens said they make moral and ethical decisions based on what the Bible teaches. This is shocking until we look around us and perhaps even within our own homes. Do parents and preachers really think they could deny obvious biblical truths and expect their children to affirm that the rest of the Bible is true? The world and sometimes believers attack Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created. Listen, if you teach your children that Number one, this massive universe is a great big accident. Number two, that this world designed with a host of factors, each of which is essential for existence in human life, happened by chance. And number three, if you teach your children that the intricate complexity of the human body is a mere happenstance, then you are teaching them there is no truth. And if, as a Bible believer, 
you teach your kids that Mark 16, 16 does not teach that baptism saves when Jesus clearly says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, then you teach them to deny absolute truth. The work of the Holy Spirit was to guide the apostles into all truth, John 16, 13. Then the apostles through Scripture were to teach us to observe all things that were commanded, Matthew 28, 20. But if you take a truth-denying stance on Genesis 1 and 1, Mark 16, 16, or any other scripture, can you really be surprised and upset when they later tell you that 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 does not really teach that adultery or homosexuality is wrong? Oh, yes, the Bible does read, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But when we begin con contradicting any plain truth from God's Word, we short-circuit the Holy Spirit's work and render Him unable to convict of sin. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A lack of truth translates to a lack of freedom or continuing bondage. A young Jew entered an old cathedral in Europe one of the most famous cathedrals in the world. An organ of great value was housed in this old cathedral. The organist who played the instrument had developed an undying affection for the organ. He was the keeper of the keys with total responsibility for the instrument. The young Jew asked the organist about the organ. The old man's glistened with pride as he explained, it is the finest in the fatherland, sir. The young man expressed a desire to play the organ, but the organist refused. He explained how special the instrument was, insisting that he could not let a stranger play it. The young man persisted until finally the organist surrendered the keys. As the young man began to play, the organist's anguish was replaced with unparalleled joy. The music began softly like a gently blowing breeze, then rose to a high level which sounded like pearls of thunder. Then. The storm subsided as thunder was silenced, and the music receded in volume until it was like the breathing of a baby in her mother's arms. The young stranger finished, lowered the lid, locked the organ, and returned the key to the keeper of the keys. Still entranced by the music, old, the old man asked, What's your name? Felix Mendelssohn, sir. With tear-filled eyes, the old man said, To thank the master was here, and I almost refused him the key. The Holy Spirit is the master who wants to play on our hearts through the Word of God. The Holy Spirit wants to bring out of our lives all the beautiful melodies for which God has designed us. Can you refuse him the key? Stay with us after our song, and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message and help in getting right with God.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. I hope you have allowed the Holy Spirit through the Word of God to communicate truth to you. There is absolute truth. If you'd like to get a DVD of this message, number 922, uh, 922, that's right, the Holy Spirit, a free CD of our singing, or our free Bible study course that you can complete at home, we hope you'll call us or write us. Now, when you complete lesson one of the Bible study, you send it in, we'll grade it, and send it back to you with lesson two, et cetera, until you complete the course. Please visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos, hear podcasts, and read transcripts of the program. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.